point one. Okay. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet everyone here today. My name is Derek Vikiru. I, I am a communication expert. I am a seasoned editor, as the professor has mentioned. I work as an editor for Management Magazine. I work as a senior sub-editor, that is my, my role. I also consider myself as a digital native. I also like to see myself as a content creator and a writer. I have extensive knowledge in media relations and public relations. Uh, editing and writing. Uh, I also I have also done field reporting in the past, and I have worked with different uh, top international companies and government organizations, and even academic institutions. But here in Kenya, uh, uh, I have also interest in brand management uh, and digital communication. I do a lot of uh, relate, relationship cultivation with my clients. I also do outreach and strategic communication uh, for different organizations. Uh, I've also worked with professionals uh, to help them in improving their media buying and social media monitoring and media placements. Uh, they I also help them with doing media campaigns. Please excuse me for a minute. <laughs> He has small children, so <clears throat> that's okay. I've, I've actually pulled up his uh, PowerPoint just to get ready when he comes back, and he's prepared a very interesting PowerPoint. And uh, he's, there's a couple of interesting things too. We have to please ask him questions. Uh, you know, it's very, uh, it's very unusual for myself to be able to gather, uh, you know, uh, people that I've worked with and I really spend a lot of time with in uh, East Africa and people that I work with in Japan. So please don't hesitate. I think you'll find it uh, quite interesting. I don't think many of the students that I know at Joga, at, for example, at Osaka Jogakuen, have had experience talking to journalists and finding out more. And a uh, very interesting, I think, well, I think it's a very interesting thing. We're gonna ask him, please make sure that you ask him questions about his new venture. Okay, he's back. Thanks, Derek. <clears throat> uh, apologies for that. I see you have already put the presentation up. So uh, just to finish my introduction, uh, other than working with organization and working uh, in the newsroom and having experience working with a magazine, I am also launching my own digital multi-platform magazine. It's called Envision Magazine. The magazine will majorly be focusing on uh, business, entrepreneurship, investment, and finance. Of course, it will have other sections that will light, lighten up the magazine, like uh, travel. It will have sections like uh, product reviews. It will have uh, opinions, uh, just to, to make sure that the magazine is not a very hard read. Uh, majorly, I will be targeting the young people because I understand that uh, most young people, especially in the today's world, they are not looking out for employment as such. Most young people are looking to start their own ventures. And that is the whole uh, thinking behind this magazine. It will be a one-stop uh, information center for anything you need as far as your business is concerned and progressing, understanding the market and just general knowledge about the business environment. So uh, enough about me and going straight into the presentation. Uh, today I'm doing this presentation on behalf of the Summit International Institute and I'll be taking you through uh, introduction to journalism. It's quite an extensive topic, but I have narrowed it down uh, to what is most relevant and what is most current as we go on. So can move on to the next slide. Oh yeah, uh, that is a little write up about uh, Envision magazine. So as I was saying, it's curated for young entrepreneurs and we have taken time to understand that uh, entrepreneurs, to understand entrepreneurs and the help that they contribute to this world. And we are here to help them recognize their value to the world. So we believe that entrepreneurial spirit is 
something that you you need to be born with you're not taught in school the, the entrepreneurial spirit and what most people always need is just the inspiration and with the envision magazine you will get the inspiration you need so uh the site is not yet live but i have put a dummy site there uh will be live uh, in the next two or three days but with the dummy site uh you can see how the the website is progressing for now. So uh, getting right in, what is journalism? Uh, I know most of us have a different idea and definition of what we think journalism is, but in the very simplest of terms, we define journalism as reporting and writing news and packaging it for an audience. So uh, for any journalist or any reporter, you will definitely be speaking to an audience and largely the audience are the one that perceive what is news to them and what is not news to them. But as a journalist, you have a great responsibility of making sure that your audiences know and understand uh, what is current, what is new and what is trending. Uh, let's say at that particular moment in your different countries. So uh, we say that a journalist actually faces a very difficult challenge in setting, in setting the goal as a high priority to determine what is news. Because uh, as a journalist, you are gatekeeper of information. You are the one who decides what goes out as news and what you want to filter, what you determine what your audiences need to listen to and what your audience uh, probably will not perceive as news. So that is the greatest uh, role of a journalist. And that is definitely what defines a journalist as successful or not. So if there is a saying that they say uh, in journalism circles that you need to have a nose for news. So if you have a nose for news, then you're a very good journalist. But if you don't, then probably you need to reevaluate the profession. So as a journalist, as I mentioned earlier, you're a gatekeeper of information and you and not the audience are the ones who decide uh, what news items will be and you present them to, you present it to them. So once you forfeit this right to control uh, access of information, then you stop being a journalist. So we can move on to the next slide. So uh, where can we find news generally? We have uh, the typical sources of news where definitely like newspapers. I know most of you have either read a newspaper this morning or an e-paper for that matter. Uh, you can also get news from magazines, although magazines are not so much uh, news oriented, but you can get journalistic content in magazines. Uh, definitely the internet is a very big resource. Uh, in case of e-magazines and all that, you can get uh, news from the internet. Uh, TV as well. Uh, all of us watch television either every day or from time to time. We have access to a TV and that's where probably it's our go-to uh, point where we get news. Uh, of course, I didn't mention radio, but radio is also one of them. Uh, and I would just have bundled TV and radio as broadcast journalism. Uh, we have others, these ones, uh, the different sources where you get news from. Uh, this could range from anything from your friends to social media, to apps, whatever, to podcasts, all that. So those can be different sources of news. So uh, as a journalist, there are primary roles that you need to, there are primary roles that journalism uh, plays. And these ones are spearheaded by a journalist or your role as a reporter. So one of the biggest uh, role of journalism is news reporting. And I think when we started this discussion, we've majorly delved on news reporting as the main highlight of journalism. 
So uh, this is a very high priority in broadcast, in broadcast journalism and newspaper. When we say broadcast, we mean both uh, TV and radio. So uh, these ones are driven by news content. Their content is normally current, it's fresh, and they produce this content every day. So, but we see that this uh, appetite for new content or for what is occurring every day is not a high priority when you come to magazines or to yearbooks. So magazines are normally known to keep record uh, or content in magazine is what we describe as content that cannot go stale. If you get a magazine from 2010 right now and you read some of the content in that magazine, you will find that most of that content is still relevant today. So uh, magazines do not focus on content that expires the following day or content that expires uh, two days from now, but definitely content that has a long shelf life. So, uh, so is yearbooks. Uh, I know most of you who've been through, maybe in your former high schools, uh, you had an yearbook. Uh, most governments do have yearbooks and yearbooks are normally a matter of records and the information stored there is also uh, targeted for a very long period of time. It's more of hist historical information. So, uh, but as a journalist, you have to decide what is newsworthy depending on where or what, where you are working. Are you in broadcast and newspaper? Then you know what should be news. Are you working for a magazine? or are you working for a near book? So uh, another role that journalism plays is definitely entertainment. Uh, entertainment varies from you and me, and it's questionable in different settings. So whatever you find as entertainment is totally different from what I'll find as, as entertainment. But in most cases, uh, this role overlaps. So we can see uh, news action as being entertaining, uh, equally, we can see entertainment information uh, that can also have an informative value in it. But generally, with what you define entertainment, most of it you get it from journalism. Prof, let's move on. Okay, also uh, another role is for record keeping. As I had mentioned earlier that most record keeping is normally in yearbooks and we can also say magazines to some extent play this role, but records, we know their value is largely historical. So the yearbook fits perfectly for record keeping. And then a community image. We say that journalism is the mirror of the society. So through journalism, we are able to understand what happens in our different societies. I don't know, uh, for those who've watched news yesterday in your different countries, uh, definitely there was a big news story that would reflect what is going on in your country. Uh, for example, here in Kenya, if we have anyone following uh, Kenyan news or following East African news, there was an expose yesterday on one of the media outlets, it's called Nation, Nation Television. And there was this expose about all these funding that the government has re uh, received from different uh, international bodies about for COVID-19, to help in the fight of COVID-19. But uh, somehow that all that money has been mismanaged. So that was the biggest news that uh, broke last night and it's the talk of the day to day. Uh, you check Twitter, that is what is trending, that's what is current. So uh, this one definitely reflects what happens in our society and it determines how we perceive the society and the image that we place within the societies or the communities that we live in. So uh, journalism also educates. Uh, most of us have actually learned most new things through the media. So uh, all the knowledge about the current trends in technology, in finance, in investments, in markets, agriculture, you name it, you'd find that you've probably uh, 
learned it from media or from news or any any information outlet before you even went in to look for more information about that particular subject. And then uh, journalism also plays a role of influencing opinions. So uh, your work as a journalist is to help shape the opinion of the public, of the audiences that you're speaking to. So uh, you need to shape their public perception uh, in a particular subject, especially when it comes to things like politics, let's say things like health, because uh, I would tell you for sure that most of our perception about COVID-19 or the coronavirus pandemic that you're currently in has been shaped by media. We've actually been following most of this information from media. So whatever we know now and whatever we perceive or believe COVID-19 to be is what we have learned through the news. So that is a perfect example of influence. Another example is through is politics. You will find that uh, in most cases, a media house will tend to incline towards a particular political side. Uh, if we take a classic example of the US, we'll see like uh, CNN. CNN is pro-Democrats and Fox News is pro-Republicans. So you will find that Fox News will always report, uh, will report positively about, let's say, the president and Republicans in general and the Republican Senate and all that, senators, I mean, and all that. So this one will try and shape a positive public perception uh, towards those, towards the president and the people in his camp. They will equally report negatively uh, about the Democrats. So this one will also help shape or shape opinions and public perception as far as Democrats are, are concerned. So CNN is also doing the exact opposite. So that is how you influence the public as a journalist. So uh, what is the extent of journalism? Uh, definitely it covers just uh, four areas. And as I had said earlier, we have the audio. We get our news through audio sources and these include radios and podcasts mainly. And then we have the audiovisual aspect. Audiovisual is now uh, sound and images. So sound and images, this perfect example is mainstream TV. Uh, and then we have print. And print here, we've said that we have newspapers, we have magazines, we have yearbooks. And then we have the digital sources, which I believe most of you young people uh, fall in. And this includes blogs, uh, digital magazines, e-papers, social media, uh, video on demand, or like YouTube and Vimeo. Like for example, in most cases, all my news, I just catch up on, on YouTube or I catch up on e-magazines so that I don't have to spend a lot of time sitting in front of a TV, uh, catching up with news and I can catch up with news just on the go. So that is uh, how journalism extends. So we will look at uh, journalistic models that we have. And these ones, they could be varied. Depending on which book you're reading, uh, they all have different journalistic models that they explain. But I have narrowed down to a few which I feel like they are relevant to our times today. So we have the advocacy model. From the word advocacy means that standing for something, shouting about something from the rooftop so that people can actually uh, know where you stand. So, and I have given an example of this using the example of Fox News and CNN. So we say that it provides news from the perspective of a political party. Uh, and this model, this model uh, defined journalism until the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and still, I find it today, this model of journalism is still in existence today, especially in African countries, uh, where 
you will find that most media houses to some extent are partisan to a certain group or they're championing uh, ideas and ideologies or opinion of a certain group, a certain political party. So uh, in most countries, we say that this one has faded as political parties also lost power to mass communication and, and I mean mass circulation of newspapers, which is definitely mass communication. So when communication started moving out to the masses and we'd have like a newspaper circulating thousands and thousands of copies to reach thousands of audiences, then the political parties started losing power to control uh, media houses. So these models started to fade away. And it has been ex ex accelerated, especially in the 21st century, with the onset of social media. Now that we have social media today, you will find that mainstream media is always playing catch up with social media. So news will first be broken out in social media, and then you will see mainstream media pick that up and now broadcast it as, let's say, news of the day. But in most cases, you'll find that uh, if there's, an, there's something happening in Nairobi today, let's say, uh, this is a bad example to use, but let's say, the, uh, like, last year there was a terrorism attack in Nairobi, last year in January. Uh, I don't know if you guys had, but if you check online, you will find it. So uh, we got the news fast through social media, Twitter, Facebook, because people would post about it there even before the mainstream media would get on site and start covering. So power has gone back to the audiences. Power has gone back to the people, and they're the ones who are controlling the media now. So this model uh, in the 21st century does not have a place. So we say that it still exists in things such as magazines for special interest organizations and newsletters. So you'll find that an organization like Summit, they probably have their own magazine and this magazine is totally skewed towards the interest of Summit. And so they advocate for what Summit stands for. So that is what we refer to as the advocacy model. And then you have the market model. Just like the name says, it's market driven. Whatever drives the market is what uh, this journalism will, will stand for. So the, this one, it provides whatever kind of journalism that an audience demands because what is newsworthy is determined by advertising. And magazines are big players in this, uh, in this type of, in this model. For example, in a magazine where I work with, I will cover a client, I will give client editorial coverage because they are paying for it, because they are advertising with the magazine. So whatever they are saying is probably not newsworthy, is probably not what the audience is interested in, or the audience is probably not interested in the organization, but it is my job as a journalist to make sure that whatever I am reporting about this organization is news or has some news worthiness in it. So it is my job to make sure that any information I report about this organization is top of mind for people or comes off as news to anyone who's going to read about it. So you do a research, uh, you speak about their initiatives, what they're doing, let's say as far as CSR is concerned. Uh, you try and enlighten and inform people about the organization so that whoever is reading that story, they'll be like, oh, I didn't know such an organization exists or I didn't know uh, such a company exists and this is what they do. So I have served that purpose of making their story newsworthy as much as they were not really a news piece or news item that would have been picked up. So the content here is selected only to make money. Uh, for, the, for the owner of the media house or the magazine or the tabloid, they, they are interested in making money as much as they are giving you editorial coverage, but their 
first uh, cause of action is how much money they can make from you. And then you have the trustee model. Uh, this one is what uh, our day-to-day -day media houses run with. Trustee model is where, uh, as a journalist, it's your work to determine what the audience needs to know and deliver it to them. And this is where now they, excuse me, this is where the gatekeeper role, gatekeeper role of um, journalist comes in. So as a journalist, your work is to decide what is news and what do you think will interest the audience. So this one is based on an assumption that uh, the reader or the viewer does not have time or the skill to find out everything that is happening around them. And so they will have to trust you, the journalist, to do so. So for example, we have seen some stories break out uh, about governments. Let's say, for example, uh, as an ordinary person, you know that that is not the information you can get on your own. So, uh, but you know, as a journalist, because a journalist has access to places like high government offices or government officials, they're the only ones who can get that kind of information. So we trust them. We trust them to give this information to the audience or to us. So that is what the trustee model is all about. And this is a very delicate model because you have to ensure that you do not break the trust of your audience. Because if your audience loses trust in you, then it becomes relatively difficult for you to gain that trust back. That's why you will find uh, most people say, I don't like this, I don't like this channel, this news channel, but I love this news channel. So you will find that you love that particular news channel because you trust them or you trust the, the, the journalists or you trust the person who's presenting that news. But the moment uh, they break their trust or you lose your trust in them, then you probably switch to a different news station. So uh, before we move on to audiences, I don't know if anyone has any questions that they would wish to ask clarification. Feel free to ask questions at any time, uh, anybody. Uh, you can also raise your hand, right? So uh, remember how to raise your hand. Uh, there's a way to sort of put up your hand. Yeah, so uh, if anyone has a question, please feel free to ask. Feel free to, to stop me if you do not understand any, any bit. Uh, feel free to ask me to, to repeat or to clarify. So uh, moving on, we are moving to the aspect of audiences because you know as a journalist your work is to collect information you know news and to report it but who are you reporting it to you need to report it to an audience and audiences in journalism they vary greatly uh, depending on their information consumption needs so uh, I will just take you through few classes of audiences. Again, these are classes that I packed together that I felt that they will be relevant for this particular session. And I've broken down, I've broken them down into four or five. So the first class of audience that we have is the mainstream audience. So the mainstream audience, these ones, they read local newspapers, uh, and they watch local news, and they are interested in things like uh, sports and crime news, but they're not interested in foreign news or in international news. So mainstream audience is, let's say, you'd call them basically a traditional audience that 
only are interested in whatever is happening around them or within their country or whatever is maybe affecting their businesses going forward and things like those. And then we also have a basically broadcast audience. So a broadcast audience, excuse me, excuse me for a moment. Okay, everybody, please remember to just take some notes. Also, a couple of things. I'm taking some notes of some vocabulary, and I think there's some interesting vocabulary, so we can discuss that later. But, you know, try to think about the news, and, you know, I think there's, I'm learning quite a lot here, so there's lots of interesting things. By the way, the black mark on your screen, I think it's from this Zoom. I'm not sure how to, I'm trying to find a way to make it to go away, but I'm sorry, I don't know yet. Anyway, um, yeah, so, you know, think about the mainstream audiences and so on that, uh, that we're, we're all learning about. And remember to ask questions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Mila. Uh, sorry for the interruption. I have a young, a young boy, and he's very cheeky. That's why he keeps popping up. That's why I have to keep him in check. But uh, pardon me for that. So I had spoken about the mainstream audience. So moving on to the broadcast audience. So the broadcast audience, we say that they get, they get most of their news from local TV and networks such as the primetime news. So uh, these are people who just tune in to watch news. So they will tune in maybe at the, the nine o'clock news or they will tune in into the 24 hour news channels because all they want is to, to get particular type of broadcast news. And so you will find that uh, they also enjoy things, sections like health news, uh, news about their community. They'll also enjoy uh, news about uh, crime, say within their area. And basically anything that is broadcasted in the news that day. So think of these people as someone who can spend an entire day watching CNN. So uh, whatever news item comes next, they will still be interested. As long as the news is broadcasted on TV, they will still be interested in those news. So they don't come in to watch TV to check for a particular news item, but def uh, generally what is news uh, that day on TV. And then we have the very occasional audience. So these ones, they only tune in when something big is happening. And we see that most of these audiences are the male audience. So you'll find that uh, they will only tune in when, let's say, the president is making an announcement. Or maybe when there's, we, we all heard about the, the explosion in Beirut. So they will only tune in to get information about what is happening on Beirut. But in most cases, they don't watch TV generally, they don't read newspapers, and they only get their information when there's something big happening and it's the talk of, let's say, the country, there's a corruption scandal, uh, maybe touching on the government, the president, that is when they will actually just come into see what is happening. So they're very occasional. And we see most of these are normally male. And then we have the, cons the constant audience. This one, they watch, they listen, uh, and they read almost everything, and they like all topics. I think uh, you might have known some uh, maybe among your friends, you know, some people who are this type of audience. So uh, any moment they get, they will either always be listening to radio, uh, they'll always be watching TV, or they can even do both. They watch TV as they read a newspaper or they read a magazine, and they're interested. These are generally curious people. They're interested in knowing what is going on in different places, in different platforms. So we can say we can also 
call them a curious audience in some way. And then you have the serious news audience. So these, the serious news audience, uh, they have a little overlap with the, with the previous audience that I talked about, the very occasional, the very occasional audience. They could be more or less similar, but these ones, they rely heavily on national public radio or news hours or specialized publications like the Wall Street Journal, uh, et cetera. So uh, they like news and they like also listening to, to biz uh, I mean, reading business magazines. So you will find, uh, for example, here in Kenya, the most authoritative business magazine we'd say probably is the Business Daily. So you'll find this person will only read the Business Daily. Uh, they will only be watching maybe sections like business news, uh, whatever we consider as serious journalism. Uh, or serious news, uh, this audience is what interests this type of audience. And then you have the tabloid audience. These ones are the people who love the sensational journalism. Sensational journalism is also called yellow journalism. It touches on the softer aspects, softer aspects of journalism. So you'll find that these people, they hate traditional news and and they, they enjoy uh, things like talk shows. They enjoy, you know, those people who love watching the Kardashians, you know, keeping up with the Kardashians. Those are the people who are interested in this type of journalism. We refer to it as sensational journalism. And I would also say that this audience is normally heavily female. Can move on. So uh, this is a very interesting topic. We're moving on to the ethical issues uh, that journalists face. So as a journalist, in your day-to-day -day activity, whether you're field reporting, you're reporting news and things like that, you will always face issues that are borderline ethical and borderline legal. So you have to determine uh, what actually goes and is it the law that will take the upper hand or the ethical aspect of it that will take the upper hand? So, and one of these, uh, we have the conflict of interest. Derek, just before we move on, I think Esther had a question, if you don't mind just pausing for a quick second. Yes, please. Uh, Ask. Uh, hi. Hi. Esther, you had a question? Esther um, Otiang? Uh, maybe it was a mistake, I'm not sure. If you have a question though, please, anybody, we'll, we'll be happy to, to try to get some questions. Okay. Sorry, Derek, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh you can also post questions on chat. I will be able to see them and respond. Yes, thank you. So we can go back to the previous slide, please. Sorry, next slide, next slide, yeah. Back. Back, back, back to the types of audiences. Ah, sorry, not uh, ethical issues. No, you're moving forward. Derek, Derek, I'm sorry, this is a different system. Uh, just hang on, please. Uh, not sure. Okay, how no problem. Okay. Uh, I'll try to go backwards. Oops, that was my mistake. Okay. Um, I'm going forward, right? Uh, let's go back to the screen of, you're going forward. Okay, let's give me a quick second. Sorry, everybody, I'm uh, just... Um, uh, uh, can I ask then uh, one question? Sure. Um, yes, please. Um, yes. What's the percentage? What's the percentage of people who have TVs in Kenya or Nairobi? I, I think it's like, uh, uh, very different uh, in the urban area and the local area. Uh, but I, I read in somewhere that in most uh, areas, even in Africa, most people, like 80% of people have radios. And is that true? 
radio, and TV. Okay, uh, thank you for your question, uh, Keiko. But you'll find that in, in Kenya generally, uh, people do have access to, to radio and to TV. I, will not, I don't have the specific numbers, but uh, I will categorize them as these. In urban areas, we can say that uh, up to, let's say, 80% 80 80 of the population, they do have access to both TV, uh, they do have access to radio, and also they do have access to internet. Uh, in rural population, we'd say yes. about 80% do have access to, to radio and probably not TV. But uh, in most cases, you'll find that they also have access to newspapers and they will not have access to internet. Uh, and it's not because the internet coverage is low, it's just because uh, probably they cannot afford it. So the affordability issues of the internet also come in. So I would say that uh, it largely depends on whether the population is largely urban or largely rural. But uh, uh, as far as uh, local, local channels are concerned, because the country has uh, underwent the digital migration of TV, uh, whatever the government has done through the Communication Authority of Kenya, they have made uh, all the local channels free of charge. So uh, whether you have a, a decoder that you access your TV through, even if you don't pay for TV, at least you'll be able to get the local channels free of charge. And that uh, includes uh, local TV and local radio. They are categorized as free to air. Okay, thank you very much. And most uh, newspapers are uh, in English? They have local language newspapers? Yes, yeah, actually all the newspapers are in English, uh, uh -huh. except one that is in Swahili, because Swahili is also a big language uh, of interest here in Kenya. So uh, like in Kenya, we have one major newspaper that is in Swahili, and then uh, the rest of the newspapers are in English. And I would say that we have around six to seven major publications as far as newspapers are concerned. Okay, thank you so very much. Okay, thank you. You're most welcome. So uh, moving on to ethical issues, uh, journalists first. Okay, sorry. Yes. And one more student had a question. If it uh, yes, please ask. I have a question. Please so ask. In my, uh, my name is Mayanda. I have a question. Yes, my. So in Kenya, do you get, how do you get a newspaper? Like in Japan, people, some people will they refer to our house, but in Kenya, how they can, how can they get the newspaper? So uh, in Kenya, what we have, uh, the model of distribution of newspapers in Kenya mm -hmm. is either people can, be, can buy newspapers from newsstands. So these newsstands, mm -hmm. you will get them at different points in the streets. Uh, mm -hmm. And these are newspaper vendors, people who buy newspapers from the media house and then they, they sell. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have uh, licensed distributors of newspapers that are employees of the mm -hmm. media house so their work is to distribute newspapers to different parts uh, mm -hmm. and reach different people. Mm -hmm. And then we also use uh, courier services. Mm -hmm. And in most cases, these are to those people who have subscribed to the newspaper. So if you have subscribed and you want to be receiving a daily issue, mm -hmm. we have courier services that uh, are distribute newspapers uh, countrywide. So you'll find that by midnight, the newspaper will be out. Let's say a newspaper for tomorrow will be out. So these ones will be transmit, uh, will be distributed either by road or through air to make sure that they get to their destinations mm -hmm. uh, with good time such that people are able to read them the following morning. Mm -hmm. But I also understand that there are issues, there are areas here in Kenya that are inaccessible by road or by mm -hmm. air. 
So in most cases, these people will always get newspapers either two days late, you know, mm -hmm. or three days late. Mm -hmm. So it's, they, they face logistical challenges. So it mm -hmm. will be a bit of an issue to get the newspapers on time. But generally, if you're within a, a town or a big city, you can simply walk into a supermarket, buy a newspaper or a newsstand, buy a newspaper. If mm -hmm. for the younger audience, what they do, subscribe mm -hmm. to an e-paper. And we also, most of the newspapers also have apps. So you can just download the app and get all your news from the app. So they try get a news by themselves. Sorry. New, so they try to new. They try to get a new news, right? Current news. So by themselves. Uh, no, not exactly, because uh, here in Kenya we mostly depend on journalists mm -hmm. to get news so uh, most of the current news chances are high that you will you will receive them from a media house uh, mm -hmm. or a journalist will report about it so in most cases uh, that's how we get news but for the young people they are able to get uh, current news on their own because they do mm -hmm. have access to social media so you will find that uh, most happenings either uh, someone will post it on facebook or mm -hmm. they post it on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So you will be able to get uh, current news faster through Twitter than um, you'd get it through radio or through TV. So newspaper is not so popular in Kenya? Uh, it is popular, but it's not mm -hmm. popular among the young people. It's mm -hmm. popular among uh, the older generation, mm -hmm. I would say. So we, they believe newspaper more believe in, on newspaper or more believe on social media, which is like uh, people I, I say, prefer to read. Uh, like they believe more on social media. No, I would say the major major source of news in Kenya is mm -hmm. radio and TV. Mm -hmm. uh, that, is what, that is what people believe as credible. Mm -hmm. You know, as much as, as a young person, I will get news through uh, social media, Twitter and uh, let's say Facebook and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, that news will only pass as credible if I also watch it on TV or mm -hmm. hear it on radio. Mm -hmm. That's how people uh, will trust the source. Mm -hmm. So I would say that people still have a lot of trust in radio and TV. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. As much as we can get news through social media and many other channels, if it's mm -hmm. on TV, then we believe it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Those are great questions, uh, Mai, and that, but we, I'm, I think we'll hold off on some questions until uh, we're almost done the slides because of the time constraints. So thank you though, everybody. So we'll have time hopefully at the end. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, moving on to the ethical issues that journalists face. Uh, one of the ethical issues, we have conflict of interest. So what is conflict of interest? So we're saying that you're interviewing someone uh, with a specific point of view or just to get even with those who might have wronged you so let's say uh, i'm interviewing i'm going to a government official and all i want to do is to report on a corruption scandal uh, or to to report negatively on them because let's say it benefits the media house or it benefits me the journalist or i am getting back uh, sort of revenging uh, whatever this person did to me. Uh, that is an ethical issue because you should not use journalism. You should not use journalism to settle scores uh, with people. It's wrong. So as a journalist, you need to avoid anything that might compromise objectivity uh, in the reporting of truth. 
So conflict of interest can also be in the case whereby someone gives you money so that you report their story in a positive way. You see that compromises your objectivity and probably you will be forced to skew the truth because you have already been bribed. So that's uh, one thing that uh, it's an ethical issue that as a journalist you will face every day. You will go to cover news and someone will offer you money. Uh, someone will offer you goodies. Uh, someone will try to bribe you in a way to deter you from reporting what exactly is happening. So you need to be to watch out for that as a journalist. And then we have issues of plagiarism. This is an ethical issue, not only in journalism, but also in academics. So plagiarism is claiming that someone else's work is your own work. So essentially, and I have experienced a lot of plagiarism when working as a sub-editor. Someone will send in an article, but if you just do a simple uh, plagiarism check, you'll realize that about 50% of that work has been copied from the internet. It's just copy and paste. So it's not really their work, uh, and they have not even attributed that work to the original source, but they take that work and pass it off as their own. So this one, in essence, is just stealing people's work, and it is wrong. You're not supposed to do that. As a journalist, you should always endeavor to be original, uh, give credit where it's due and always make sure that when you, you state where you get your information from, that is actually crediting uh, information. So, and this includes even photos. Let's say you're using photos in your publication, make sure uh, you insist that or you attribute the source of the photo. And then we have an issue of anonymous sources. As a journalist, in most cases, you will find that uh, you will be required to, to hide your sources when you're reporting news. You've gone to a place, you've visited a, a source, and they have told you that they are willing to go on record. Uh, they are willing to, to speak to journalists, but they are not willing to go on record. Uh, they want you to hide their identity. So when it comes to dealing with anonymous sources, as a journalist, you should not, you should not, uh, you should make sure that you do not disclose your sources. If you're supposed to protect your sources, you protect your sources to the, to the death. Even if uh, you're threatened, you're summoned, or anything, you're supposed to make sure that you do not disclose your source. So in most cases, you'll find that some journalists uh, go and get some piece of information anonymously, but if they're threatened or their families are threatened, then they have to disclose their source and say, I got this information from so-and-so. In this case, you'll find that you're putting those people's lives at risk and they will not trust you anymore with the information in case you need some more information from them. And then we have uh, offending or detestful content. So uh, just as it says, uh, use of vulgar language in journalism is, is a bad practice. Uh, giving uh, content that does not appeal to your audiences or is not in sync to the culture of the people that you're reporting with, it's also a bad practice in journalism. So you need to understand your audience and understand what they find offend, offensive and what they don't find offensive. So, uh, and then you have bias. Uh, we know that as human beings, you cannot be purely objective. You will always be biased. So in many cases that uh, you will make sure, the fact that you can select one story to air over the other, that's already bias. But as a, journal, as a journalist, we believe that you have been trained and you're able to focus on objectivity and we will always trust your judgment as far as uh, 
selecting what story to air or as far as your gatekeeping role is concerned. So uh, we believe that uh, bias, as a journalist, you will put bias to a minimum to make sure that you achieve uh, the objective of your journalistic objective. And then we have invasion of privacy. So invasion of privacy, uh, this has to do with allowing people to have their personal space. So it's often a legal issue, uh, but it's also an, an ethical one. So it depends that, uh, for example, if you have uh, information about someone, how did you get that information? Did you break into their office? Or did you break into their house? Or did you break into their car for you to get that kind of information? So how you get information, it matters a lot whether you invaded someone's privacy or not before you bring that information to us. So it's an ethical issue and you can also be sued for this if you knew you got that information from, from invading someone's privacy. And then another, or probably the last ethical issue that we have is commitment to accuracy. Make sure that when you are always reporting or uh, collecting your information, you need to be as accurate as possible especially when you're dealing with anonymous sources. You need to get an, a second source that will be able to back the first source and say that they are telling the truth. Uh, when you're stating facts and figures, make sure that they are verified and you get that information from verified sources, let's say like government ministries, uh, bureaus of statistics, and different trusted sources. So it's very important to always check out facts uh, and also check out your information and your sources to make sure that they are credible and they are accurate. So uh, probably this is the highlight of this presentation, modern day journalism. So modern day journalism is the kind of journalism that we experience today. So we can say that modern day journalism has been made possible by new technologies and new inventions such as social media, the internet, we have video on demand, and we have globalization. Now that the world has been, is more globalized than ever, we are now a global village. I'll be interested to know what's happening in Japan, what's happening in the US, what's happening in Kenya, uh, what's happening, let's say, in South Africa. So this one has, in itself, has changed the way journalism, has changed journalism the way we used to know it. So, and it has given rise to this new form of journalism that we refer to as new media journalism. So let's move forward and understand what new media journalism is. So uh, just as the name suggests, uh, new media journalism uh, emerged actually towards the end of 20th century and beginning of the 21st century. And it converged uh, with the advent of uh, digital technology and computer-based technologies and telecommunications. So, uh, so we say that new media, new media technologies are shaping journalism in four basic ways. So we see that uh, these new technologies have transformed how journalists do their work. Uh, it has caused uh, restructuring in journalistic organizations. These are like media houses and all that. You go now to a newsroom, you'll find that there's a digital team, there's a mainstream team. You see, uh, it has also given rise to new media content forms. Currently we have uh, content forms like YouTube, we have Vimeo. So all these are different forms in which you can relay content. We have social media. And then it has also led to the reinvention of relationships uh, among, between and among journalists, media houses, and their different publics or their audiences. 
and even the government. So nowadays you don't have to be a journalist in a particular media house for you to report for that media house. We've had things like freelancers come up. Uh, we have, we've had things like uh, correspondents come up. So we can even rely on the local community. If I am a journalist in Kenya and I need uh, information from let's say Japan, I can definitely talk to a person I know in Japan who will go and check out and verify for me the information and I can be able to, to report here in Kenya. And like in the old days, I'd have to fly all the way to Japan just to get the information that I want. So you say that this, this set of changes is leading to a new form of journalism, uh, which has a greater citizen involvement and citizen participation. And this is what we refer to as citizen journalism. Just like I was saying in social media and Twitter, you of it through social media. And how did they learn of it through social media? Someone posted it on social media. So the person who posted it, that person can be considered a citizen journalist. They are probably not trained, but they can see the newsworthiness of whatever they're sharing on social media. So uh, <clears throat> understanding the impact of uh, new media journalism uh, to us today. So uh, it has caused uh, journalism to undergo a fundamental transformation. And this, since the day when the first press was invented to today, uh, we can say that for sure journalism has changed. We do not have to rely on one source to get the information that we want. Instead, we have multi-platform sources where we can get different informations that are all accurate. And these are what we refer to as alternative media. They always make sure that they counter the narrative that is propagated by mainstream media. So mainstream media will always make sure that they adhere to facts and make sure that their story is credible so that it cannot be challenged by alternative media. So we can say that uh, in many other ways, this represents a potentially better form of journalism because it can re-engage an increasingly distrust, distrusting and alienated audience. Uh, over time, we have seen that most people have lost trust in media because we find that probably the stories they're reporting are not factual or they're not objective. So we don't listen or we don't follow news in the media anymore. But with alternative journalism, uh, those people who do not trust the media have started building their trust uh, in, in journalism again. And the audience that had been alienated is gradually being brought back to following uh, news or events happening in the media. So at the same time, it presents threats uh, to the most cherished values and standards of journalism. Because with all those ethical issues we've spoken about, when it comes to social media, these, none of them is adhered to. We have seen scandals being broken out on social media, uh, very, very private information being shared on social media, very private photos being shared in social media. So people don't care about invasion of privacy anymore. Uh, people don't care about the other side of the story. So that is where uh, new media has actually taken journalism to. So uh, this also puts a big question in journalism education of today. How do we prepare the next generation? And the next generation is now you guys. So how do we prepare the next generation of journalists? So we say that uh, in journalism, no matter how much the world changes, some things should never change. For example, things like checking facts, uh, uh, replying to re relying on reputable sources or known sources, uh, preventing, presenting facts in a way that is impartial, uh, asking tough questions as a journalist, 
and also adhering to highest ethical standards as a journalist. These are fundamental principles of journalism and they should not change depending whether you are a modern day journalist or you're an olden day journalist, you should always make sure that you adhere to these standards. So, but also we understand that uh, some things also must change inevitably uh, because we are living in an interconnected world. So for example, the things and tools that a modern journalist needs. So you will find that uh, in today's world, as I had mentioned, you don't have to fly to a particular place for you to get a particular type of news. So technology has enabled a collection of news from different parts of the world uh, that would make even news or information in our media rich. So some of the things that have actually changed is that uh, as, a, as today's journalists, we can see this among the tools that you need as a journalist. So things like uh, recorders, we've seen uh, advent in technology as far as uh, recording is concerned. So people can actually go as undercovers uh, to get information without anyone knowing that you're recording them. And then uh, things like uh, not taking, Today we can just do uh, notes by Apple. You can use uh, uh, softwares like Evernote or Google Notes. Uh, word processing documents, we, you don't need a physical computer anymore, but just online you can get your Google Docs. If you want to edit any Word document, you can definitely use Grammarly. So, and many other sites like Grammarly. So, it's made uh, editing of news or word processing of news a bit easier. And then we've seen audio editing softwares that have come up, uh, so, such as Adobe Audition, Audacity, or the GarageBand. This one can help you edit any piece of sound on the go and present it almost instantly. And then uh, transcription service, when you go and record someone, you don't have to come and listen to the whole recording again for you to convert it into a Word document. We have transcription service such as Remy and uh, Rev and Temi. So, uh, as far as uh, modern journalism is concerned, please make sure that you read more about uh, modern journalism and being a modern journalist, make sure you do enough and extensive research on new media journalism. But uh, also journalism is not just a craft. It's not just uh, an, a, a career where you just need to be employed. There's the business side of journalism. As a, as in the media industry is huge and as a journalist, you are one who's better placed to make sure that you can create a business out of your profession. So we say that business for the media industry has largely moved online <clears throat> with the entrepreneurs largely focusing on niche markets with frontiers in publishing and broadcast. And you, there are those uh, blogs, blogs or news sites that you normally follow and you really trust them. And these could be magazine websites that you rely on when you want to get uh, information regarding a specific topic. So for example, if you want to get uh, information or news about hotels in Kenya, you'll probably check out TripAdvisor. If you want to get maybe business news and all that, you'll probably check out the Wall Street Journal or you'll check out the Financial Times. So we see that these news sites, they are focusing on a particular niche. If you're a business site, focus on business site. If you're a travel site, focus on a travel site. If you're a tourism, you focus on tourism and so on and so forth. And we've also seen uh, this happening in broadcast with all these uh, YouTube channels that come up. Uh, we all know that there are many, many authoritative YouTube channels 
that are even bigger than community media houses and the people trust them even more. So you will find that uh, through these uh, online publishing and say online broadcasts, such as establishing a channel on YouTube, you can be able to establish yourself as a media owner. You can be able to establish yourself as a business, even through podcasts, because you'll be able to attract advertising. Uh, you'll be able to, to attract uh, talent, uh, quality talent. You'll be able to relay uh, quality content as far as journalism is concerned. So we can say that uh, since the early days of online publishing, making a profit from content site has been very hard. But today, <clears throat> with all these advents in, let's say, Google, uh, Google ads, you, I know you have come across uh, extensive advertising when you're, br you're browsing online. So through social media, through Google ads, through YouTube and YouTube ads, these are simple avenues that as a journalism student, you can start and make sure that you earn some extra income through your craft. So we say that uh, that is beginning to change uh, news, it's beginning to change information, entertainment, and consumption. Uh, information and entertainment, as most of us shift our consumption online. So I think the best thing that has ever happened to journalism is the internet. So internet is a big resource that you can simply center your entire business on the internet. Uh, either to become a, a publishing website or a publishing company that is purely based online or a broadcast company that is purely based online. So we say that today building a multi-platform digital publishing company is a profitable venture as most publications establish their presence online where the audiences are. And this is one, one thing that I am trying to do with my magazine, the Envision magazine. I realized that already on the internet, you have the audience. So all you need to do is that this audience is looking for information. They are hungry and they are thirsty for information. So what you need to do is provide that information from them. So you establish yourself, make sure you monetize your site and make sure that you are able to generate income from uh, your craft or from your skill. So uh, that is a presentation that we had for today. Here are further, this is resources for further reading. So uh, you can look at these books. Uh, one is called Engaging Journalism. It's Connecting with the Digitally Empowered News Audiences. It's by Jack Batsell. It was published in 2015. It's a very resourceful book. You can also check out Business Strategies for Magazine Publishing. Uh, How to Survive in the Digital Age by Mary uh, Hogarth. This is also a very recent book. It was published in 2018. Uh, you can also read uh, about journalism and new media, a book by John V. Uh, Pavlik, published in 2001, and also a, mo a modern day journalism workbook by Magro Hill. Uh, it was published in 1993, but I can tell you that this book is still relevant today. So uh, you can look out for these books either on Amazon and purchase them and make sure that uh, you get something to, to engage with. Uh, I also have some uh, discussion questions. Professor, I shared with you on your email. Uh, probably you can be able to, to put them up or in a discussion platforms that uh, the students can engage further with. Yes, thank you. Uh, did that work? Are you, did I stop? Yes, okay, great. Thank you very much. That was excellent, Derek. Um, I, and just while we're getting, uh, before we do the discussion questions, there were a couple, I think one or two more questions from the audience. Uh, everybody, if you wanted to ask a question now, that would be, this is a great opportunity. Um, and then I'll give you the, the discussion questions in a moment. Anyone with a question, you can feel free to ask. Um, 
<clears throat> anything is okay. That was, uh, I think, um, really interesting. By the way, Derek, can I just, um, I would like to mention something. Um, yeah. you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Question somebody had? Yes, uh, my name is Bernadette and I have some few questions to ask. Please go ahead. Okay, um, my first question uh, is that uh, as the owner of um, Invision, Invision Magazine, you have talked about something about, about plagiarism. So uh, the question I have is, how do you protect your information as the owner or as a, yeah, as the owner of the magazine to be precarious? And the second question is, um, in Kenya, I, I saw that it is a developed country. Uh, I'm just curious about knowing how do you make sure that people with disabilities, especially blind people, how do you make sure that they get all information? At least um, they can hear, yes, but sometimes you find someone is, is having a hard hearing impairment and also um, is also blind, blind. So how do you ensure that all information is reaching to everybody? And the last question is, um, how is the state of journalists in Kenya in terms of security or, I mean, uh, comparing to Burundi, uh, it happened that some some journalists are being put in jail due to, to some information that they 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 revealed, which touched maybe the government or some other important person in the political party, and then they may be put in jail. So how is the security? So maybe you can answer all the all of them at the same time. Okay. Uh, thank you for those uh, very insightful questions. Uh, I'll start with the first one. As the founder of uh, Envision magazine, or basically any person who runs a, a magazine, they are normally, you need to come up with uh, terms and conditions, and you need to come up with uh, privacy policies, and you need to come up with policies on usage of information that is contained uh, in your website. So, uh, you should not prohibit people from using the information that they have in your website. Uh, they are free to use that information, but they should be able to attribute the source. They should be able to attribute that they got that information, let's say from Envision Magazine. Uh, they should okay. be able to attribute and recognize that it's someone else who wrote uh, that article and they should be able to say that they are quoting information from that article either because they find it informative or not. Uh, and in case uh, someone uh, uses your information and they do not uh, acknowledge the source, there are normally legal avenues that you can pursue uh, to make sure that uh, mm -hmm. that one is stopped. Because plagiarism is a crime that is punishable by law so yeah. uh, if you go to court, you can always get uh, justice as far as uh, your content being stolen. Concerned. Right. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> your second question was on people with disability. Yes. Uh, I would say that uh, that has actually been a very big challenge as far as uh, consumption of news is concerned. But, mm -hmm. uh, but in, very, in very few occasions, because uh, I would say that in most cases of people who have uh, visual impairments, they will get information through audio sources. So they will get the news through a uh, radio uh, or get new, assisted to get the news through podcasts and all that. For people who have mm -hmm. hearing impairments, uh, for example, on TV, there's always a sign language interpreter, especially in the Kenyan TVs, all, almost all TVs in Kenya, they have a sign language interpreter. So when the presenter is anchoring news, there will be a smaller mm -hmm. screen on the side where the sign language interpreter will be interpreting the news for the, 
people who have a hearing impairment. But now, uh, what about you know, those who have? Okay, yeah, all right, go I, ahead. I was going to that now. Uh, for those who have both, for those who have uh, both the visual and hearing impairment, uh, then in most cases that uh, becomes a challenge. But I know as far as uh, print media is concerned, they can always be assisted to get information mm -hmm. through by use of Braille. But as far as audio no, and no. visual is concerned, then uh, it will prove a little bit difficult. All right. And then uh, on your third question, your third question was about uh, freedom of the press. Secure. Yeah, yes. security, security of journalists. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that uh, for a country like Kenya, we have really advanced and we, we have achieved that freedom of press, so to speak. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of instances where journalists are arrested and put in jail because of uh, relaying some form of information. But I have seen journalists mm -hmm. being uh, persecuted and uh, I've seen journalists being attacked uh, while on duty. I have seen journalists, okay, ju just excuse me for a moment. Okay. Okay, everybody, um, while we're waiting for Derek, we're coming close to the end of the time. Um, these are questions I'll post into the uh, Google, um, uh, the Google Classroom. And uh, those were some of the, those are the three questions that Derek came up with today. And again, I'm recording this, so it'll be up on the, um, on the uh, website. Also, uh, I'd like you, I'd, I'm going to ask Derek if he's looking for content for his new magazine which is a really interesting opportunity, perhaps, for those of you who would like to try your hand at writing. Okay, Derek's back. Thanks. Uh, so I was talking to, I was replying to the question about uh, the security of journalists. So what, yeah. because we've seen these instances happen where journalists have been attacked, uh, and in some cases they've even been attacked by the police, or they've been attacked by goons, uh, what the media houses does is they provide security for their journalists, especially if you're going to do a live coverage of a particular event or you're going to get information that is sensitive. They'll make sure that uh, your security is provided for, security of your family members is provided for, and also they ensure that... Um, as far uh, in case there will be any uh, legal claims against you, the media house will try and cover the cost in case you are taken to court uh, in line of duty. So we haven't really achieved a hundred percent freedom as far as the okay. as far as press freedom is concerned. But I would say that Kenya has made big advances. Uh, compared to most African countries, as far as freedom of the press is concerned. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, just to mention, uh, Derek, the uh, in Japan it's quite free, so they don't have a lot of you know political problems. Um, so, Derek, I'd like to ask you then: um, Are you looking for content writers for your online magazine, from particularly young people? Yes, uh, I am looking for content writers. If, if you feel like you need to contribute to the magazine, please reach out to me. Uh, our focus mainly for the magazine is around uh, business, entrepreneurship, uh, investing uh, around finance. So uh, if you feel like you are confident about contributing uh, content around those areas, please feel free, reach out to me. Uh, I will have a look at your content and then I will let you know when it has been published. And I look forward to having most of you as regular contributors to, to the magazine. <laughs> and we grow this magazine together. And um, also, what I'll be doing is sending everybody links to the magazine. It is gone uh, in the next few days, it's brand new. Um, yeah just curious and I'm just I don't know the answer to this but what about 
uh, you know, trends in Asia or new business, new business trends or new social trends that might be monetized at some point. Uh, would that be of interest as well if, if, if something were like that to come up? So this is just a couple of thoughts, but uh, we'll... Uh, yes, uh, definitely the, those are areas that I'm interested in. Uh, because when I mention entrepreneurship, I don't limit it to, to just starting a business. There are those people who, let's say people like freelancers, they basically make their money through uh, their freelance activities and they treat it as their business. So can we get more content on how freelancers can monetize their skill, uh, how people who have, uh, let's say, private sites, I mean, personal blogs or personal sites, how can they monetize their their sites, uh, just any information around how young people can use the skills that they already have to make money, or they can gain new skills or what skills they need to gain to make sure that they earn an extra income. Because we know uh, today it's detrimental to make sure that you only depend on an employment to make income, because there is no much of that especially uh, in African countries. So if we can get information about, uh, we can even get case studies comparing uh, how the young people in Japan are doing or are conducting a particular business, craft, skill, you know, and all that, and maybe uh, how the same can be applied, let's say, in Africa. Right. Or how we can have... Uh, things that Africans are doing, and maybe their counterparts in Japan can probably borrow from. Very interesting. Okay, thank you very much, Derek. And uh, so what, what I, again, what I'll, what I'll mention is I'll make sure that everybody gets a copy of links to the magazine as soon as it goes live. And yes, uh, please. You know, some of your special homework for the next, uh, next week will be to uh, comment on the magazine. And uh, also, um, if you'd like to comment to our guest speaker, please send emails, messages. You can send them to me. We'll forward them on. Uh, the discussion questions are here. I'm sorry, we're out of time. And I think some people have really strict uh, timing. So, uh, but it's, uh, it's now 532. So um, we've gone a little bit over time, but it was a fascinating talk today. I'd like to say thank you very much to Derek uh, for all of that. That was very, very interesting. I think we all learned quite a lot from it. So thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, yeah, so uh, again, messages, uh, send them, and we'll make sure that, uh, that uh, he has a chance to look at some of those. And uh, best of luck with uh, the new magazine, Derek. And I look thank forward you to so much. Thing. All right. Thank you. Okay, everybody, it's now 5.30, so have a great day, and I'll see you again, yeah? I'll send out a newsletter after. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, great day, everyone. Thank you. See you. See you. Okay, everybody, I'll, I'll end the meeting. Thanks again.